Hello, welcome back to the Social Contracts Research Network. I'm delighted today to be joined by Wayne Swan. Wayne is Australia's third longest serving federal treasurer, holding that post from 2007 until 2013 at the height of the global financial crisis, and also serving as Australia's Deputy Prime Minister from June 2010 to June 2013. He's currently the national president of the Australian Labour Party, and over the years, Wayne has returned time and time again in his writing and his speeches to the theme of the social contract. So it's wonderful to have him with us today. Wayne Swan, welcome. Good to be with you. Now, the, the social contract, as I said in the little introduction, was a theme that you've been returning to time and again in your writing and in your speeches over the years. Um, and I'd love right at the beginning to get clear on, on what it is that, that we're talking about. Um, so in your opinion, what, what do we mean when we talk about Australia's social contract? What are we trying to get at with that language? Well, I think it, its origins really uh, hark back you know, to the construction of the welfare state post Second World War and the events that led through from the Great Depression. And essentially, you know, the welfare state was established post-war uh, as a commitment to individuals. And it was put together in many ways as a response to communism on, on the left and fascism on the right. And basically it recognised that uh, a strong state needed to intervene, uh, that um, open markets, uncontrolled and unregulated, delivered very unequal outcomes. So what we saw following the events of the Great Depression through the Second World War was a commitment to basically a welfare state, broadly defined, uh, where, where collectively we had an obligation to all of our, uh, to, to, to each individual in our society to do our best for them to get ahead. And there was a collectivist philosophy which said that the things that we do together are the things that make us strong. And uh, laborism, which is what I identify um, uh, the Australian Labor Party with and other Labor Parties elsewhere in the world, you know, has that as at its very core, uh, the concept of unionism, of workers coming together to collectively bargain uh, to make sure that uh, people are, are paid decently and treated decently at work. So what we've seen um, since uh, the end of the Second World War has been the effective erosion and deconstruction uh, of the welfare state put together for those reasons that I outlined before. And we've seen become predominant uh, the, the Reagan-Thatcher uh, mantra of uh, what uh, I think Richard Dennis calls the right-wing ratchet, uh, which is this trend towards uh, smaller government, uh, less government intervention, uh, higher profit share, lower wage share, and destruction of social safety nets in health, education, training, and so on. So we've seen a, a, a marked movement away from those collective principles that were enshrined at the core uh, of the social contract that delivered the welfare state be dramatically eroded across many, many, uh, across many Western countries. And accompanying that has been uh, uh, the development of um, very high levels of, of uh, economic and social inequality across uh, many Western nations. Uh, and the consequence of that has been a political polarisation. Now, Australia has been lucky uh, to avoid the worst uh, impacts of, for example, what's occurred in America, uh, because we've managed to keep several very important elements uh, of that social contract in place as the rest of the world threw them overboard. Uh, a, a, a commitment to uh, collective bargaining, decent industrial relations, strong healthcare systems, uh, the use of fiscal policy to keep employment strong. Uh, but even those uh, have been the subject of fairly significant erosion in recent years, uh, leading even here uh, to higher levels of inequality. And of course, you know, as inequality grows, uh, it not only weakens your potential for growth, uh, it also poisons your society uh, and empowers uh, big money uh, to have much more influence in politics. So if we are to return to a decent social contract, uh, we have to put in place a range of policies that uh, are not only economic, uh, uh, which, which uh, uh, drive uh, opportunity uh, for people, but also a series of political reforms that dilute the power of big money in politics. Mm -hmm. So the social contract is, is always a threat when big money 
is calling the tune in your political system. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is um, an alarm bell that you've been sounding for, for a long time, isn't it? I, I remember a, a major article that you wrote back in 2012 uh, for the, the publication, The Monthly, called the 0.01%, in which you, you identify two main threats to the social contract, uh, one of which is vested interest and the other, as you've just been um, outlining, is inequality. I, I wonder if we could just deal with vested interests first. Um, and... A skeptic might say something like this, mightn't she? Look, there have always been vested interests in, in every society, in every political system. Why would it be particularly bad today? And, and do you think it's actually got worse since 2012? Well, unquestionably, it's got worse since 2012. And uh, we, we are seeing the outcome of that in rising levels of inequality uh, and the resistance to... Uh, uh, the ultimate social contract, which is people having the capacity to live in an environment that is sustainable. So uh, the power of vested interests is what's driving increased inequality. Mm. Um, and I'm not referring here to, uh, you know, some of the more basic elements of, of, of accountability. And certainly there have been a, an erosion of a whole of a whole series of individual and, and, and political accountabilities in our system. I'm talking about the use of big money uh, to produce significant political outcomes, to drive the profit share in the economy up and the wage share in the economy down, and to resist fundamental structural reforms in the economy uh, in, in terms of climate change, which are essential to our survival as a race. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, if I was writing that essay again that I wrote in 2012, the 0.1%, the, the power of vested interest in Australian politics, uh, we've seen uh, vested interests exercise more and more power uh, since then. And, and in that time, the issue was uh, resource rent tax. And, of course, there was the emissions trading scheme, the price on carbon uh, and our clean energy package, both of which uh, were um, vigorously attacked from the right. In parallel to that, we've seen the Americanization or what I now call the Trumpification of the conservative parties in this country. And, you know, they are now just a, a mirror image of significant parts of the Republican Party in the United States, far divorced from their conservative origins of Robert Menzies here or, or Ronald Reagan in the United States. Uh, and essentially, they let it rip. They let the power of big money rip at a whole variety of levels. You see it in, uh, in the debate over tax policy. You see it in the debate over wage policy. You see it in the debate over national superannuation. And, of course, you see it in the, in the debate over climate. Yeah. If I could just circle back to Trump for a moment, um, is, is one issue for the argument that you're making about vested interest and that you have been making for many years, that the, the discourse over um, vested interests and uh, certain small cliques of people running the country has actually become a right-wing discourse recently. I mean, it's, it's Trump's idea that there's a political elite running Washington and, you know, we need to drain the swamp and so forth. And I, I guess some people might look at what you're saying and, and equate those two discourses, saying both sides of the political spectrum are simply saying that the, the cards are stacked against them and the elites are working in the opposite direction. So how how would you convince someone who who does think that, you know, that they're all the same, Trump, Swan, they're all saying that, that the system is biased against them. How would you convince someone like that, that your calling out of these vested interests is not a Trump-style rejection of, of a social and political elite? Well, it gets harder and harder when the, when the established media and increasingly social media is, is dominated by uh, the amount of disinformation put out uh, uh, by many of these very significant and wealthy players in our system. I mean, there's no doubt that as inequality has grown in the United States and as its social safety net has been eroded, uh, that has produced substantial disillusionment amongst the masses of people in, uh, in that country, a loss of faith in the political system, which has then in turn been exploited, uh, but even, even more rigorously and viciously uh, by, uh, by big moneyed interests um, in, um, uh, in that country. Uh, and, of course, we've had a lot of that here in recent years. I mean, essentially, the Murdoch media has now become an arm uh, of the Conservative Party, or the Conservative Party has, in fact, become an arm of the, of the Murdoch media would be a, a more accurate way uh, of portraying it. Uh, 
Uh, one of the reasons why the Labor Party is still reasonably successful in this country uh, and, Labor, and, and Labor parties have not been elsewhere have, have, have been that, um, you know, we, we've maintained vestiges, vestiges of, a collect, of collective bargaining, uh, which has given uh, the Labor force more power here than many other comparable countries. Uh, the Labor Party is based on a union movement, which has in the past given us um, a greater strength on the ground and greater funding capacity. Uh, the Labor Party here is, is in good shape, it, it is in far better shape than other centre-left parties around the world, precisely because we've not seen the complete erosion of all of those mechanisms that give working people a far greater say in their society. Uh, the tax system has become much more unfair in this country, but nowhere as unfair as, as it is in many other developed economies. That has meant that working people have had a better say in the education, a better, a better go in the education system over time. Um, you know, we have had um, disclosure, disclosure laws here, at least product of, of a few of, of a past Labor government, which has made the system a bit fairer. Uh, but where the imbalance has has come in recent years has been the preparedness uh, of, um, of of private individuals and very large companies to start deploying their money in a political system in, if you like, an American way, which has made that battle uh, much harder uh, for the Labor Party in this country uh, in recent years. When you've got someone like Clive Palmer, who can put down $100 million at an election and campaign only against one party in the parliament, then you've got a very, very serious imbalance. Now, we saw the beginnings of this trend back in 2012, which I outlined in my essay. We've, saw, we've seen it deployed uh, at subsequent, subsequent elections, but never have we seen what occurred in the last election, where a single individual put $100 million on the table and campaigned exclusively against one side of politics. Mm -hmm. So all of these global trends that have led to disillusionment amongst people about democracy uh, have been evident here, but not as great because we had a far better social contract, a far strong, a stronger social contract for longer. But even the advantages of that are being eroded. You can see it now, for example. One of the great strengths has been compulsory voting in Australia, which, 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 is, which has been a very essential part uh, of uh, our egalitarian uh, contract. Uh, in this country. Now that's even under attack from the coalition in, a, in the forthcoming election. So, so when we're talking about what sort of social contract should we have, uh, if we want to have a society which has got a degree of equality, which has got a degree of mobility, it has to be one built on a, on a, on a number of pillars. A strong fiscal policy, which delivers strong employment outcomes, and lessens, uh, if you like, the, 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 the slack in the labour market, a very strong fiscal policy to do that, a system of strong progressive taxation to get the resources to invest uh, in the social safety net and maintain public health, um, strong bargaining rights and power for workers collectively in unions and a strong voice for unions uh, in legislation, and, of course, very strong electoral rules which dilute the power of big money in politics. That's the essential uh, package you need uh, to have some chance of getting a decent social democracy in operation, which works for the interests of, of, of the many against the interests of the few. And this, this chimes in really strongly with something you're saying in your book, The, the Good Fight, which is that the biggest vested interest uh, in Australia is news limited. Um, Yes. I guess some people might say, well, look, that's only one news organisation. Anyone is free to set up and, and fund a, a news organisation in this country. If they wish, surely diversity in, in media is, is a good thing, isn't it? We don't have any diversity in the media in this country. Uh, news, Limiter, uh, news Limited is dominant uh, and, and it's a leader and it uses that dominance to bully and cajole other media outlets, including the ABC. Uh, to uh, to to provide coverage, which at times, even for our broadca Australian Broadcasting Commission, is not as independent, as steadfast as it could be. It operates like another political party, poisoning the media out, uh, the media, the, the the media coverage of other outlets uh, as well. And if you ever wanted an example of that, it's been watch the the the, the behaviour of the tabloids uh, in response to uh, President Macron's. Uh, accusations against the Prime Minister. Now, it's true that in that case, the ABC was a very good counter. 
you know, and having an independent ABC is an absolutely essential part of trying to preserve a social contract. Um, and and, and uh, the importance of that was seen in this episode where they didn't get pushed over and and uh, and uh, manu- outmaneuvered uh, by the Murdoch media. Um, you know, the, the media is a very important part of this discussion. You know, you've got you've got the legislature, you've got the executive, you've got the judiciary, and you've got the media. And if your media is not functioning pro- properly, then you've got a big problem in your democracy, yeah. which is why the Trumpists and so on and and the Murdochs. Uh, play their hand as aggressively as they do. So j- just before we leave this question of media, let's let's try and shift from diagnosis to prognosis. And so there's there's a whole bunch of things wrong, which you've, you've very persuasively outlined there. Um, in in an article that you sent me earlier today that you're in the process of writing at the moment, you said we need a much more robust public debate to win the hearts and minds of Australians. And so I guess the question is, how do we get from where we are to that more robust public debate, what needs to happen to foster that that um, diversity of views in in the media in this country? Well, we have to be uh, in the labour movement as inspiring and as good as we can possibly be, and and deal with the cards that we're dealt. Um, and you know, and it can be done. I mean, notwithstanding the hundred million that was put on the table last time by Clive Palmer, the, the election result was very, very close, very close. So that tells us, even given the odds being stacked against us, that elections can be winnable. If you look at the um, the recent result in the Queensland state election just a year ago, um, uh, last weekend, uh, they were opposed vehemently uh, uphill and down dale by the Conservative parties and the media establishment across the country, and they won. But it's a lot harder to do that at the federal level. All I'm saying is that we we have to be as inspiring as we can. We have to generate as much grass level support as we can. We have to be better at them when we do our social media uh, and, and, and many other and many other campaign techniques. We have to be much better uh, than we may have been in the past if we're going to overcome uh, the uh, the hurdle that we face. Would you advocate top down regulation at all, or do you think it's all simply in the Labor Party up in its game? Well, I don't think, well, we haven't got any prospect of regulatory change. And you might well recall that when we were last in government, we wanted to have an open debate about media structure. We are actually having that debate now and this discussion about what the government does to regulate or not uh, social media. So that that debate's happening and and that debate will continue. And there's no question in my mind um, that there there will be substantial reforms in the area of social media, media, which will backwash their way through the conventional media. That's, That's happening now. Um, and, and and it will be there for everyone to to debate uh, at some future time. But yes, there does need to be fundamental reform in, in a whole variety of areas. Um, but the most important thing to have is a strong, independent public broadcaster. Uh, it's that is what served Australia uh, well for a long period of time, and it can serve Australia well into the new envi- media environment in the future. One of the reasons why the ABC is so viciously targeted targeted by the Murdoch media is because they moved into social media aggressively early on, were effectively a first mover, uh, funded uh, by uh, by the then Labor government to do so. Yeah, thank you. I, I'd like to, to pivot a bit now into to questions around trust and civility as, as part of the social contract. There was one line in, in particular in your valedictory speech to, to Parliament that really struck me and really sort of has rattled round in my head ever since, really. You, you said democracy cannot survive in the morass of mutual resentment that we're currently seeing. Uh, it's yeah. a very dramatic warning. Yes. Do you think that our democracy is in the balance today? Absolutely. I, I think democracy is in the balance around the world. Uh, less so here than in other countries, but definitely under threat. Um, the whole right-wing ratchet, uh, which has culminated, if you like, in the in the rise of uh, right-wing authoritarian parties around the world, which is discredit and demonise government, muddy its effectiveness, make it uh, uh, defund it so it can't actually provide services uh, competently or comprehensively and then turn around and say, well, you couldn't trust government to do anything for you. Here's a tax cut. That's essentially the the offering from uh, 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 the radical right around the world. Demonise government, 
make it hard for it to actually perform effectively so that services aren't, aren't fully valued. Make those services um, smaller in a bit and discredit them and then go on to grab power on the back of the fact that you've already demonised and, if you like, destabilised effective government. Uh, and essentially that was, first of all, the, you know, the, and, and that has effectively been uh, what we've saw, seen from the Tea Party uh, in the United States, and it's essentially the basis of the whole low-tax small government mantra that you see coming out of the government uh, here uh, in Australia. Take the NDIS, an absolutely overdue massive social reform, an essential part of the social contract with disabled Australians and has been comprehensively sabotaged by this Conservative government. That's the model. Take robo-debt and Centrelink, another way to completely discredit what was a first-class organisation with a first-class workforce, give it a set of rules and regulations which can't be implemented, which punish people, and then blame Centrelink for the outcome. There are so many examples here, it's not funny. That's the model. So if democracy is in the balance, who can save it and how do they save it? Well, only interested citizens can, uh, can, can save democracy. Only people power uh, can save it, not only save it, but strengthen it and preserve it. And I believe in this country there is enough interest, enough concern uh, to preserve democracy. But it's not alarmist to say that there are threats to it, particularly when you look at the behaviour uh, of, of our media at the moment and the lack of accountability of the government for just about anything uh, that, that it is responsible for. But ultimately... Uh, a successful democracy depends upon strong, vibrant political parties. Mm -hmm. The right will have succeeded if political parties cannot rebuild and, and increase their membership and, and activism and participation. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, those, for all who are in interested in democracy, if you're not contemplating join, joining the Labor Party, at least join some party that's interested in democracy and a vibrant public life to save us from what's actually coming from the authoritarian right. On the question of trust, um, you were speaking in March this year, I think it was, at a, an event hosted by the McKell Institute, and, and you suggested there, um, and quoting you here, that, that the Liberals are not entitled to the good faith that they're asking the electorate to give them. Um, and again, this was a line that really struck me. And I, I guess the question that comes out of that is, what does that say about our social contract if the major political parties consider each other to be in bad faith? And, and what can we do to rebuild faith, perhaps first among politicians and then from, by other people, faith in politicians? Well, part of the problem here was that the former Labor government um, was subject to an extraordinary um, vilification by uh, the current government. I mean, it was unheard of to see royal commissions being set up into the activities of a previous government. Uh, and those uh, royal commissions, fortunately, came to naught. But they were an ex extremely provocative way to behave in a, in a democracy. So uh, I think the only thing that will hopefully bring some sense uh, to the conservative establishment in Australia is, is a substantial electoral defeat. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they've been emboldened in, in, in many of the uh, Trumpist-type activities they've engaged in by the success of politicians like Trump and Boris Johnson uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, so. Uh, we effectively need more involvement at a grassroots level of more people determined to ensure that we can get back to much greater civility in a political system where the rules of the road are observed by both sides of politics uh, uh, and, and that's not really uh, where we've been with the coalition almost from the day of its election in 2013. One of the issues that, that's really central to the, the research project that I'm involved in is, is precisely what you've just been talking about. What is, what is held in common across the political divide? What, what remains part of the social contract, regardless of what party is in government? I'd, I'd love to read you, if I could, a, a quote from Robert Menzies, actually, from 1954. Um, he's um, talking about what, uh, what remains the same in politics when the government changes. Um, and he says, we're all Australians uh, of common race, language, literature, traditions and religious faith. 
Uh, with few exceptions, we began life with no advantages of wealth or social position. We believe in the equal rule of law and the dignity of self-government. We're British through and through. We're for the crown, we're the Queen's men and women. We believe in progress, in development and in social justice. What a wealth of agreement we have here. If we concentrate on our differences and forget our unities, politics will sound and be like a civil war, close quote. Of course, what strikes us today in that quotation is so much of what Menzies calls the wealth of agreement is no longer common. No, in, 20, in 21st century Australia, I mean, many would say that it, the country is much richer for that. And so how would you write a paragraph like that today? What is there in our social contract today that transcends party politics, that survives changes in government, that crosses political ideologies? Well, I still think there's enough goodwill and a desire for us to be a democratic state with a degree of equality and opportunity across the political system. We're just going to have to clear some people out of parts of that political system to get back to it. Um, I'm old enough to remember when Hawke was uh, elected uh, in 1983, and he ran on reconciliation and reconstruction. And it wasn't just about dealing with uh, policy problems, it was about the type of government uh, we should have. And, and that was one that, where he brought people together employers and employees, you, you recall the summits, the economic summit, and the whole the accord and, and those sorts of things. This is not rocket science. It's been done in Australia before and it can be done again. It was done during the war. It was done by Hawke in 83 and 84. And I do believe it can be done uh, by, uh, by a new Labor government. I don't think anyone on our side of politics really thinks we want to see the lowest common denominator or confrontation that we've seen uh, coming for the last, um, you know, eight or nine years continue. It's not good for anyone. There's no appetite for it. And particularly for those like myself who've been on the receiving end of it, would actually like to see uh, a new tone as well as a new practice or an old practice returned uh, to a degree of civility, cooperation and common purpose. Yeah. In, in The Good Fight, you cite the economist Stuart Lansley. Um, who argues that, and this is another quote, the legitimacy of capitalism rests on the existence of an implicit social contract between the rich and the rest. Rampant money-making of the sort witnessed today is dissolving that contract before our eyes. In, in your opinion, is capitalism as such compatible with a strong social contract? And how do you make those two things um, Well, The, the trickle-down model of capitalism that we've seen evolve in uh, into the extreme is not, um, you know, and uh, that 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 is very clear. Uh, but you know, there was a time where 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 uh, corporates committed to higher levels of corporate tax as an implicit part of the social contract. Um, uh, so, and there was a time where where having unions and employers sit in the same room and have a bit of argy bargy, but but come out with a um, uh, an agreement. Uh, what was not novel. Um, I, I, I believe it, we can reconstruct uh, a social contract uh, which recognises that there has to be a fair, fairer distribution of wealth and income. You just can't, it's not sustainable to have a society where smaller and smaller numbers of people are gathering up but larger and larger amounts of, of the government's, uh, of the nation's product mm. uh, because people can see that that le leads to less opportunity. Fewer and fewer people with more and more more and more people with less and less is a recipe for lack of trust, for resentment, uh, and for uh, and for um, civil uh, disorder. So part and parcel of a social contract has to be a recognition uh, that there's a fair sharing of resources and a fair sharing uh, of burdens. I take great heart uh, to see the ESG agenda now, uh, particularly in the context of climate, but I regard it as much wider than that. Uh, receiving uh, much more attention at corporate levels. Now, I'm sure um, many people see it purely as environmental, but it's not. It's much wider than environmental, and it goes to the very core of the nature of, of our society. Back in 1945, when they put the, the welfare state together, mm -hmm. uh, implicit in that notion was that all corporates had a wider social responsibility to their employees and to the wider citizenry of the country. That got lost in the Thatcher-Reagan revolution and the race to the bottom on tax levels and the race to the top on executive salaries. 
sorting those things out will be absolutely important and as important as sorting out uh, the, um, you know, emissions, uh, the carbon emissions profile of the firm. It's also the uh, the tax emissions of a firm. It's the wage, <laughs> the wages that their people uh, receive. And it's a profit share, wage share, that matters. So we got to get to a decent uh, social settlement or social contract on carbon emissions, just as we have to get to a decent uh, social and economic settlement on wage share and profit share. Both can be done and both are part of the same recommitment to joint purpose, to a social contract. I guess when people sort of think about the social contract right now, certainly one of the things they, they think about is, is climate change, uh, as, as you're rightly saying. And another thing that is still preoccupying us, um, you know, what is it, year and a half, two years after it blew up, is, is the COVID pandemic. Um, you've, you've called the COVID pandemic the greatest shock to the economy since the Great Depression. Uh, presumably, therefore, you think it's, it's more of a shock than, than the GFC. Um, and it, it's been called by many people an inflection point. It's a moment when change is going to happen. Societies are going to change because of COVID somehow or another. Um, what form do you think that change is going to take? And well, do you first, think first, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. And, and, sorry and, and do you think that the sort of problems you're identifying with the social contracts, inequality, invested interests, are they going to get worse because of COVID? Or do you think they, they might they might improve a little? Well, first of all, we didn't learn from the great. Uh, we didn't from the Great Recession or the global financial crisis, as we called it, in Australia. Uh, it shone a deep light on, uh, on on inequalities and growing inequalities across the developed and developing world, and no action was taken. And in fact, we saw following uh, uh, the Great Recession uh, levels of inequality never seen before. Uh, so when we went into the pandemic. Um, levels of inequality were at record highs. Fragilities in our societies, in our health systems, in our social safety nets were at record lows. So really the world never really recovered economically uh, from the Great Recession as we went into this pandemic. And the real tragedy will be as we come out of this pandemic, if we don't deal with those fragilities that pre-existed the pandemic and which were really shown up as to be huge problems during the pandemic. You know, if you like, the pandemic shone a light on the pandemic of low pay, of insecure work. And of course, that is a function of that high profit share, low wage share. It shone a light on the absolute critical importance uh, of, uh, of, of health care and health safety nets in societies. Uh, it shone a light on most of the pre-existing conditions which had worsened from the time of the Great Recession to the pandemic. So now, coming out of the pandemic, surely we don't want the same levels of insecurity in the workforce, of unemployment, of poor health systems, of poor social safety nets, of poor conditions for frontline workers. Surely we don't want those to continue. So in many ways, the pandemic uh, and the debate that we have to have is about how we reconstruct that, that, that uh, welfare state, if you like, for the want of a better word, uh, that, that had collapsed all the way through to the Great Recession, was in bad nick coming out of it, and whose fragilities were again exposed uh, during the pandemic. So the debate isn't a lot different from what it, sh what it should have been following the Great Recession and what we've been having in recent times. Um, it may now be camouflaged by a much quicker, seemingly quicker recovery uh, in the labour market than anything we saw in the six years that fo followed the global financial crisis. But that remains to be seen. But the same debate is waiting to be had and won right now as it was prior to the pandemic. Back in 1993, when you made your maiden speech uh, to Parliament, you, you, you made a very striking um, claim. You, you said that your, your parents' generation didn't get a fair go in this country, but that you did, uh, and your generation did get a fair go. Um, and I suppose a rather depressing prospect perhaps is that the, the generation that's now leaving school uh, may may not get the fair go that, that's right. that, that you and, and my generation had. Is, is, that a, is that a fear that you shared? Do you think that that window of having a fair go in this country has passed? 
well, it hasn't passed because we know how to uh, to bring it back. Uh, but um, you know, we, I, I am my generation, baby boomers, uh, huge beneficiary of free tertiary education. Um, we are huge beneficiaries of my generation of the opening up of Australia to the world and the world to us, uh, which has produced a degree of wealth in this country that my parents could just never have even dreamt of. You know, Australia sits here now, um, you know, on per capita income in the top three countries in the world. If you would have uh, said to my mum and dad or back in, uh, you know, 1960 or 1970 that Australia was on track to be the richest country in the world, they would have laughed at you. So uh, lots of good things have happened and, uh, and, and Australia is very fortunate to be at a very, very good place in the world, even now. Um, uh, in the era of climate change. We've got the most abundant resources of renewable energy in the world, just as, we, as we've had the most abundant resources of fossil fuels in the world. One will replace the other over time, and the opportunities for us in the region are just as magnificent as they have been for my generation, but were not uh, for my parents' generation. So I think there's, there's a lot that we can do if we can resurrect a decent social contract that delivers the social mobility that was delivered to my generation, to our kids' and grand, grandkids' generations. That's the policy challenge because it's not there now. I look around at my kids trying to get a house. I think about whether my grandchildren are going to get a house, where they're going to get educated, uh, and, and, you, and you worry about it because you can see how tough it is. I've got a friend who's trying to buy a house in Canberra at the moment, and uh, the the prices are, are like something out of science fiction. It's absolutely yeah. crazy. Um, which which sort of brings us, I guess, to thinking when okay, we've we've identified many issues here that that are tugging at the seams of the social contract. Uh, but but in recent years, you've been writing about a new social contract uh, and uh, uh, speaking uh, about that prospect. Um, in April 2020, you wrote, what we require now is what the world required and didn't get following the Great Recession, which is to imagine a new social contract. And I'd love to invite you to, in a sense, to dream aloud about that now. If, if everything goes as, as, as perfectly as you could wish it, what would that new social contract look like? Well, first and foremost, it would deal with the, uh, the challenge of climate change uh, and the industrial reindustrialization of Australia. Uh, as I said before, we've got the most abundant reserves of renewable energy in the world. Uh, and what we need is an industry policy to match the switch over from fossil fuels to renewable energy uh, and, and the jobs that will flow uh, in the new green economy. So the, it will be that switch over from, uh, from fossil fuels to renewables, renewable energy, and the establishment of the industries of the future and the export of the product of the industries of the future uh, that will underpin uh, the next uh, phase of growth uh, in this country, and I'm absolutely confident we can we can get that done. It's it's inhibited by the lack of any coherent climate or industry policy from the current government. But the uh, the way to do it, uh, the 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 pathway for it, the content of it uh, is well known. It basically resembles in many ways what Chifley did with post-war reconstruction, because it's not just a question about saving the environment. It's a question about the jobs of the future, the green jobs of the future in the green economy. No country is a better place to do that. And that's what can drive the prosperity that will give hope for our children and our grandchildren. Mm. Uh, but secondly, um, uh, none of that will be as successful as it, as it could be unless we go back and do something uh, about a greater degree of equality and opportunity of, of, of do a lot more about equality and opportunity and social mobility in our in, uh, in our society, which will mean going back and re-looking at um, our education systems and our health systems and so on. But I don't think that the uh, the policy architecture here is is too difficult. It's getting the political will uh, and the public support to get it done. Mm. The what you're saying there about the um, the ecological and environmental changes that need to make chimes in to some extent with this idea that's become a buzzword in, in recent years of the, of the Green New Deal. 
Is, is that an agenda that, that resonates with you? Well, I don't put it as a, as a Green New Deal because it's sort of it's taken out of context and it's a bit American. Um, but, you know, but, but, but Australia, you know, it, you know, we, we can power the economy of the future uh, with renewable energy to produce the products of the future. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and those products will range from green steel, uh, you know, batteries, cars, and, and it's a very, it's a very long list. Um, and that's well within, well within our grasp. Uh, one of the proudest things that I, I did as, as treasurer, along with Greg Combay, was set up the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. The only reason this government's even in the hunt of looking a little bit respect, uh, respectable on climate uh, has been the, the, the work of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which they tried for about four or five years to abolish. Um, they are such barbarians. Uh, but but the institutional mechanisms uh, and building blocks are potentially there for a quantum leap in what we can achieve. We can see it in the activities of state governments as well, if only they had the backing of an activist federal government to, uh, to redouble their efforts. So all, all, of that is, uh, all of that is possible. But all of the other advantages of the Asian century are, are still with us. We're located in the right part of the world at the right time. Uh, the Asian middle classes are growing, which will be strong demand for our export of goods, a stronger demand for clean energy, uh, but also a stronger demand for all the services that come with it, whether it's environmental, architecture, building services, tourism services, recreational services. All of that is there. All of it is there for us. Thank you. As, as we begin to draw to a close now, I guess one of the elephants in the room of any interview at the moment is that we're, we're facing a, a federal election uh, next year at some point. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on what you think is at stake for the social contract in particular in that next uh, federal election in Australia. Well, I think, I think it's all at stake um, because if, if the Conservatives can uh, behave like they have behaved on climate change, behave like they have behaved on robo-debt, behave like they have behaved on submarines, uh, the list is long. If they can continue behaving like that, then there won't be a lot of hope for a social contract if they're re-elected next time round. Um, I think Labor is well, very well positioned uh, and uh, we've got uh, a policy offering that is both realistic and I think uh, inspiring when it comes particularly to climate, uh, but we've got a hell of a job to get it out there into the community uh, given many of the um, impediments to uh, the transfer of knowledge that we run into uh, um, at the moment. But I think we've got a good chance of winning the election. I think we've got the program to do it, and I'm an optimist. I wouldn't be talking to you if I wasn't. <laughs> I think that's a, a wonderful note uh, on which to end it. Wayne Swan, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.